Hi, good afternoon and welcome everyone. We are slightly delayed, but uh, thank you for hanging with us. We're delighted to welcome you to this webinar focusing on case studies this afternoon. And I'm going to uh, very quickly hand you over to our wonderful chair of MTG7, Luca Persani, who will be in charge of proceedings today. Over to you, Luca, and thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you all participants to this webinar. Uh, we prepared this MTG7 webinar with Marco and Biagio Cangiano. They will discuss with us uh, two topics, uh, the puberty induction in males and then in females. So it will be a base case discussion together with uh, two young collaborators, Giovanni Goggi and uh, Dr. Silvia Federici together with Marco and uh, Biagio. So uh, let's start with the first presentation. Marco is working at the University of Milan and the Department of Medical Biotechnology and Translational Medicine and uh, in Instituto Oxologico Italiano. This is Biagio. So we are talking from Milan and uh, Marco, please start your presentation and uh, you will have uh, at the end of this first uh, um, set of slides uh, we will get the questions from uh, the attendants please marco go on so good afternoon to everybody thank you for being here with us and thank you to the organizer for the kind invitation to be here today and to have the opportunity to talk about pubertal induction in males so first of all just to remember that uh, Sorry, Pubert, uh, that um, pubertal development in male uh, is uh, usually um, arriving between nine and 14 years old, and that the first sign of pubertal development is represented by the testis enlargement above the 4 ml. And thus, we can define as a pubertal delay uh, a retardation of the pubertal onset beyond the expected age, and in particular, when we have not testicular enlargement by the age of 14 in males, but also when we have uh, um, lack of tunnel stage progression after the beginning of puberty. And uh, as we recently um, uh, put in our in uh, this guideline with, together with other experts belonging to the endo ERN and I had the honor to be part of this uh, group, we were indeed indicating that in male, the age in which we have to start to check for um, puberty, for uh, in the um, we have to evaluate the puberty in the case in which we suspect the delay puberty is 14 years for male or even nine years in the case in, uh, of male with a risk, uh, a high risk of uh, hypogonadism. And here I resume all the causes of pubertal delay. We can mainly uh, distinguish between three groups. We have surely the constitutional delay of puberty, which is a self-limited form of delayed puberty, uh, which is the most common form of delayed puberty. But then we also have some uh, uh, pathological form we can, that can be divided in uh, hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, but also hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And in this case, we divide again in a form which are permanent, uh, uh, like the genetic or the organic form, uh, and then uh, the functional form, which are usually reversible. And uh, the most uh, challenging part of the diagnosis process is uh, represented by the possibility to, dis to distinguish between these two forms, which are the constitutional delay of puberty and the congenital hypogonadotropic hypogonadisms. And uh, this is because uh, these two forms are completely uh, similar in uh, many aspects. Uh, and uh, what we can uh, surely uh, observe is that uh, in the cases of uh, uh, clinics, we have some syndromic features which are common in the case of CHH, while are completely uncommon in the case of uh, uh, CDGP. But if we look at the bone age, testosterone level, uh, uh, LH and FSH, basal or after general stimulation, as you can see, we have no way to distinguish between these two forms. Some more information maybe are coming by the inhibin B and the anti-malaria normal, but uh, so far we, don't, we do not have a real uh, threshold that we can use uh, in the diagnostic process. And so we can now move to the first case report uh, and that will allow us to go further inside of the uh, pubertal induction in male. And so I will uh, give the microphones to Giovanni. 
So our case report takes place within this family. In particular, it involves this boy here, who is a 12 years old male, who is known to be carrying a nonsense mutation within the gene FGFR1, which is known to be responsible for a congenital hypogonotropic hypogonadism, or CHH for short. This mutation he was inherited by, from his mother, and it's also present in his uncle and his grandmother. And the three relatives, so the mother, grandmother, and uncle, are all affected with CHH, which is why we can say that up to this point, the mutation co-segregates perfectly with the clinical features of CHH, which is why uh, the boy came to our attention in order to establish the degree of his pubertal development. From his past clinical history, we managed to retrieve a few interesting information. For example, he was born with cleft lip and palate, with microphallus and retracted testicle, which are all possible clinical features uh, associated with CHH. In particular, for the last two reasons, he was treated when he was one year old of age with low doses of testosterone for four months in order to let the testicles to definitely descend within the scrotum and also his penis to grow. After that, no other clinical evaluation or intervention was done until the age of 12 when he came to our observation. From the point of view of physical examination, we also saw that he had the bimanual synkinesis, which is known also as the mirror movement of the hands, which is another possible clinical feature associated with CHH. While from the point of view of pubertal development, as you can see, he was completely prepubertal because his testicular volume was lower than four milliliters bilaterally. As for, but still, this could also be considered a normal finding considering that he was uh, 12 years old. So below the age that defines pubertal delay. Uh, his bone age was more or less the same as his chronological age. From the point of view of uh, pituitary function, as you can see, the thyroid and adrenal axis were completely normal and just as normal were the levels of prolactin and IGF-1. On the other hand, the, gonadal, the pituitary gonadal axis was still dormant. In fact, as you can see, uh, low gonadotropins and low testosterone. Once again, however, this can still be considered as normal and consistent with this patient's age and prepubertal state. Then a GnRH test was also performed. And as you can see, the two, the, the two gonadotropins managed to raise after the stimulation uh, with GnRH. In particular, LH levels arrive very close to the threshold of five units per liter, which is the threshold that defines the um, spontaneous activation of the pubertal axis. His uh, sense of smell was also investigated and uh, the patient claimed that he had a normal sense of smell. However, when uh, a smell identification test was performed, we found out and he also found out that he couldn't recognize most of the smells that he, were presented to him, which was suggested of and was diagnostic for anosmia. And this finding was consistent with another finding that we found uh, at the brain MRI. In fact, as you can see, his left uh, olfactory, uh, olfactory structures were underdeveloped compared to the right ones. Interestingly, however, the mother and uncle of the patient were normosmic, which is peculiar considering that uh, both the mother, uncle, and the patient have the same mutation. So in this case, we have the same mutation within the same gene and still a different phenotype, in this case, from the point of view of smell. So this is our patient. He has a very strong genetic background for CHH, and he also has many so-called red flags, clinical features suggestive of CHH. So the very big question in this case is, should we treat him or not, also considering that he is 12 years old? So who needs to be treated indeed uh, when we have a prebrattal delay? Surely all uh, uh, patients that had a, a permanent cause of, hypergon uh, of uh, hypogonadism. But uh, uh, in the case of functional hypogonadism, what we know is that we have first to attempt to remove the underlying cause and then see if this is enough to allow the pubertal development to enter spontaneously, otherwise we will have to treat these patients as well. And in the case of the constitutional delay of puberty, what we will have to do is to maybe wait and see uh, for the spontaneous onset of puberty, but in some cases we have to consider also short-term uh, low doses of hormones that could be helpful in terms of differential diagnosis, but also for the uh, psychosocial well-being psychological well-being and which are the goals of the pubertal induction. Surely the maturation of the genitalia and the secondary sexual characteristic, but also the achievement of the optimal renal growth 
body composition, muscle mass, and normal bone density, but also promote the psychosexual development of these patients and ensure, when it's possible, their reproductive capacity. And uh, the other question is when we will have to start our treatment. Uh, so far, we have no, uh, there is no um, uh, a universal uh, uh, age which is uh, that which was established. Uh, for the beginning of the treatment, but surely the initiation of uh, puberty at an age which is compar comparable with the peers is essential for the normal physiological development. And we will always have to consider the underlying cause of the delay at puberty and try to individualize the treatment as much as possible. And indeed, in the uh, recent uh, um, guidelines, we were uh, indicating, we were recommending uh, to um, start a pubertal induction by the age of 12 when there are no signs of pubertal development and also in the cases in which we are uh, evaluating the possibility of a constitutional delay we are either suggesting to start anyway a treatment by the age of 14. This is because a delay of treatment could be an independent risk factor for the lower bone density of these patients and as well can uh, in cause a long-lasting negative effect on self-esteem of the patient, psychosocial functioning and sexual life in their adult life. And uh, what we also have to be, have in mind is that uh, in the real life, indeed, uh, the time, the, the, the age in which this patient came to our diagnosis is uh, usually very uh, advance uh, and this is the experience that we had in Italy and was published some years ago and as you can see in our patient prepubertal uh, CHH patient the age of the diagnosis was uh, between uh, 18 and 20 years old. So going back to our case report. So to treat or not to treat? In the end we decided not to treat this patient for many reasons. First of all he was still 12 and as I said before he was below the threshold to say that this patient had pubertal delay officially speaking. Then, the LH levels after GNRH stimulation reached a very, very close level, in, close to the threshold for defining the um, spontaneous activation of the uh, pubertal axis. And finally, we also found that, as I told you before, the phenotype in the family, in family members who were carrying the same mutation was different, at least from the point of view of the sense of smell, which is something that has already been described in the, in the literature. In fact, as you can see in this picture, these are different families in which different family members are carrying the same mutation, causative mutation of CHH. But as you can see, despite this, the members of each family are carrying the same mutation, different phenotypes are present within the very same family. And not only in the, from the point of view of smell, but also from the point of view of hypogonadism itself. So we decided just to wait and see. So we waited, and what did we see? After six months, from the biochemical point of view, nothing had changed, but still there was a slight increase of the volume of the right testes. And so we consider that as a little spark of a spontaneous pubertal development, development that was starting, that was about to start by itself. And so for the time being, we decided not to treat, hoping that it would start by itself. However, six months later, nothing had changed, both biochemically and clinically which is why in the end, when the patient was 13 years old, we decided to start the pubertal induction. So uh, how, which are the therapeutic options that we have in our end? So first we have to consider that uh, we can have uh, primary hypogonadism or central hypogonadism. For both of them, we know that testosterone is an effective treatment, but for the central hypo, we can also have another option, which is represented by gonadotropins. And as we reported in this uh, our recent review, uh, it's true that both of them are effective in terms of growth spur, bone maturation, secondary sexual characteristics, viralization, psychosexual development, but only with gonadotropins, we can have a testicular growth uh, and we can induce spermatogenesis. And indeed, uh, in the uh, guidelines, uh, it was recommended the use of testosterone to induce puberty in boys, but we were recognizing the hypo hypo patients the possibility to choose between two strategies, so testosterone or gonadotropins, and we were suggesting to discuss these two options with the, the family and the patients and to decide with them, and then maybe to switch to testosterone after the pubertal development is, is acquired. And what about testosterone? So in the guidelines, we were resuming all the available formulation. In this table, you can see 
which are the starting dose, the adult dose, the advantages, the disadvantages of the different formulation. And surely one of the first are the intramuscular testosterone and especially the ester of testosterone, which are the one that were more used in the past. Uh, and maybe actually, and these uh, usually started with a dose of 25, 50 milligram monthly, and then increase 50 milligram every six months till the, the doses of the adult. Uh, and uh, is uh, surely effective, but uh, other experience are also coming to the testosterone and the canoate, although are applied so far only to young adults. And another possibility, a very nice uh, possibility, is represented by transdermal formulation that does not need any more injection. And uh, this was uh, demonstrated to be also effective in the um, pubertal induction in male. Finally, we can have also the oral, the subcutaneous and the intranasal uh, formulation, although for some of these uh, formulations, we have so far no uh, available data for the pubertal induction. And another point that we have to keep in, uh, in mind is that not all these formulations are available in all countries. And one first uh, uh, um, issue that we can consider when we decide to start with uh, the induction with testosterone is uh, what we will happen in terms of spermatogenesis in these patients uh, uh, in the future. And uh, this review from Giulia Rastrelli is telling us that the previous treatment with testosterone apparently is not affecting the future response in terms of spermatogenesis in our patient, although the P, as you can see, is very close to the significance. And this other study was uh, confirming that the previous androgen use does not compromise the gonadotropin response, but delays the onset of spermatogenesis and may reduce the chance of conception. So the second option was gonadotropin, as I told you before, and this is important for the stimulate, to, the, to stimulate the testicular growth and the spermatogenesis, but it's also true that this may uh, give significant psychological encouragement to our patient due to the testes grow, can induce early the spermatogenesis and maybe reduce the time requiring the future to uh, reinduce the spermatogenesis and also can achieve an androgen profile which is closer to the normal biochemistry. And again, what we know from the literature in this uh, table from the guidelines, we were resuming all the study the available at the moment and so, as you can see, uh, what we can realize from this table is that uh, there are heterogeneous studies in terms of patient number, uh, in terms of age of the patients, length of the observation, therapeutic protocol adopted, the heterogeneous are the results, and there are very few randomized clinical trials. One is this one from the group of Nile Pitelud and Andrew Dwyer. They were checking for the fertility as the first endpoint, and they were treating 18 patients. Finally, they uh, just have 13 patients. Six of them were directly treated with uh, GenerH pump pump for, for two years, while seven patients were pre-treated with a recombinant FSH daily, 75 units. Uh, for four months, and then they were shifted to the uh, GnRH pumps. And what they observed? They observed that uh, the inhibin B level in the pretreated patients were higher compared to the patients that were not pretreated, maybe suggesting a higher number of uh, Sertoli cells. And also, the sperm count was higher in the patient pretreated compared to the one that were not pretreated. And indeed, when they were checking to the histology, they were demonstrated that the Sertoli cell in the patient pretreated with FSH were higher and uh, compared to the other. And there was also modification in the structure of this testicle, indicating that maybe TSH, uh, FSH sorry, plays uh, other roles beyond the cell proliferation in humans and could be important to maximize and prime the Sertoli cell compartment before the androgen-induced maturation by GnRH or ACG. And this makes sense if we uh, consider that in the physiological activation of the axis, FSH is the one that is activated. <clears throat> this other study is a, a larger multicenter study uh, from Germany. Uh, they treat uh, HH patients either congenital or acquired, and they divided into groups. One group is uh, uh, group A, where, uh, where we have patients completely prepubertal, so naive to testosterone, while the other group is represented by patients that were induced by testosterone and then stopped for six months and then treated with gonadotropins. And what they show, they show that the final betacicular volume is not different between the two groups, and also the sperm concentration apparently is not different. But if we look at the concentrate of the percentage of patients that arrive above the threshold of 60, uh, 15 million per ml, this uh, percentage is 50, uh, 61 in the case of the pretreated uh, of the naive patients, while it's only 32 in the patients that were pretreated with testosterone. 
Also in our institute, we have an, in, uh, we have a, an experience with the treatment uh, of uh, uh, CHH patient with uh, gonadotropins, and we were retrospectively analyzing our data on 19 patients. 12 were normal osmic CHH patients and nine Kalman syndrome. As you can see here, you have the data of the patients. Some of them were uh, harboring mutation in the known causal gene, and 13 of patients were pretreated with FSH. And what we observe in our end, we observe that cryptorchidism is uh, correlated with the betacicular volume and uh, is a, a negative uh, uh, predictor of the final betacicular volume. And the same also the presence of uh, pathogenic mutation in the known causal gene. And when we check for the seminal analysis uh, in 16 patients, 12 of them had an active uh, uh, spermatogenesis and five of them in particular had a very nice uh, activation of the spermatogenesis. But in our end, there was no differences in terms of, uh, um, uh, uh, of activation in the pretreated patient with FSH compared to the one that were not pretreated. And this maybe could be due to the lack of randomization, the low cohort numerosity, but this is also true maybe for the study of uh, Nelly and Dwyer. And so surely we need a larger randomized clinical trial. We want to really clarify this issue. And this is the last uh, uh, study published in the literature, again from Germany, are 17 patients completely prepubertal, and they treat the patient again with gonadotropin. In this case, they use a recombinant FSH, uh, uh, the long-acting formulation, and they also uh, have, um, uh, register an uh, increase in terms of the sequelar volume from a mean to, of 2.2 from 12.9, they register an increase in terms of testosterone in even B, but there are no data on the spermatogenesis. And uh, when we induce a pubertal development, we will also have to follow up our patients. So what we will have to do first to check for the clinical uh, uh, aspect of our patient in terms of uh, pubertal uh, tunnel stage progression, and uh, so genital development, testicular volume, and viralization. This has to be done every four, six months, or any time we change the dose. We have to check for the height, the weight, the growth rate, the blood pressure, the compliance and the satisfaction of the patient is also to be considered, and the side effect appearance. And in terms of lab and instrumental tests, what we will have to do is serum testosterone and dematocrit every uh, six months, or when we change the doses. We have to check the testis ultrasound when it's indicated by the physical examination. We have to check the semen analysis, the conclusion of the gonadotropin treatment. We have to check the bone age annually or up to the final height achievement and the bone mineral density at baseline and at least after two years starting the treatment. And so going back to our, to our patient, let's see what happened with our so we, dec we decided to treat the patient and uh, we first started with FSH alone for four months as a form of treatment and then HCG was introduced as, as progressively increasing doses throughout time for up to 35 months of treatment. And this is what changed in the patient. For example, the testicular volume from very, very low level of volume of testes bilaterally, the patient managed to reach 15 milliliters bilaterally, which is a very a uh, good result, a normal volume for an adult patient. His penis also grew from 4.5 to 10.5 centimeters up to 35 months. His testosterone levels, of course, did not change when FSH alone was started, but then as of the introduction of HCG, as you can see, testosterone levels raised progressively at the progressively increasing doses of HCG itself, which is consistent also with the appearance of the first selection, pubic hair, axillary hair, and beard throughout time. His bone age managed to keep up with his chronological age. And finally, this is the, um, these are the growth curves of the patient. As you can see, as of the moment that HCG was started, both his height and growth velocity increased. Finally, at the end of the induction, a similar analysis was performed during treatment with gonadotropins. And this is the result. As you can see, this is not, of course, a normal semen analysis. However, considering the diagnosis of CHH that this patient has, 20 million of sperm cells is not a bad result at all. So that was a good result. So in conclusion, uh, delayed puberty is defined as the absence of physical sign of puberty to standard deviation above the mean age and affect approximately 2% of adolescents. 
A timely diagnosis is important, and we saw that the differential diagnosis between constitutional delay of puberty and CSH, NCHH is really uh, challenging. The optimal age to begin the treatment uh, has not been universally established, but the prompt initiation after diagnosis of delayed puberty is recommended between the physiological time frame whenever possible. Treatment must be tailored according to each patient's clinical history and needs. Treatment should not only lead to genital maturation, but also promote the psychosexual development. And the most consolidated therapeutic strategy for male is represented by testosterone, especially ester of testosterone, but also the newer formulation has been used with promising results. And the gonadotropins are a very good alternative uh, because they increase the testicular volume and they induce the spermatogenesis. Surely, randomized clinical trial larger are needed to uh, maybe identify in advance which are the patients that really deserve this treatment and that really respond better to this treatment. And also, uh, maybe the treatment with the gonadotropins can uh, uh, reduce the time necessary for the reinduction of spermatogenesis in the future gonadotropin cycles in the adulthood. And this could be important consider that the timing in which uh, uh, the, the age of, uh, in which the women uh, at the first pregnancy is uh, increasing. And again, uh, the um, um, treatment with gonadotropin can allow us to identify in advance uh, one, uh, the, those that are poor responders to the treatment or also no responders because they are autospermic. And in, so in this case, we can consider cryopreservation in advance or also to check for TZ before to switch to testosterone replacement therapy. And so finally, let me thank all the people that are working with me and of course, all of you for the kind uh, attention. Okay, excellent Marco, excellent presentation. Now we go for questions on this first, uh, on, this, uh, on, the to on this topic, so males. Uh, I see a couple of questions from the audience. The first one, Marco and uh, Giovanni. Uh, Dr. Payan, Payan T, sorry if I pronounce it wrongly, but uh, and tells us partial CHH can be difficult to be differentiated from G CDGP, especially in the early stage. Do you think that there is a role to monitor AMH and inhibiting B trend in this group of children when considering options of wait and see or uh, versus three doses of intramuscular testosterone to jumpstart the axis? So, uh, thank you for the question, it's very nice. Uh, of course, these two, as I told you uh, shortly before, these two uh, markers are promising markers, uh, and uh, there are studies that uh, try also to uh, set uh, some threshold that could be uh, useful in the differential diagnosis, either for IMH and for inhibin B. So surely these two markers can have a role in the future, but uh, at the moment we do not have enough data uh, to have a threshold that we can consider. And so uh, for this reason, we cannot use it. Uh, another promising test could be also the uh, Kispeptin challenging test, uh, which was adopted in UK. Uh, but also in that case, we need uh, more data before to, to have the possibility to use this marker in the routine clinic, let's say. Yeah, we lost uh, five seconds of your answer at the end, but I think it was uh, it was clear for the for the audience. So you are saying that AMH and inhibin B can become useful. Uh, yes. If, yes, if but evaluated longitudinally in one single patient. Yes. But you don't have data on this particular case or uh, other no. cases? In this special case, no, we do not have uh, the data. Because in uh, transversal ev uh, evaluation, uh, there is a quite large overlap between in these values, you, isn't it yes. clear? Distinction cannot be done transversely. Okay. Uh, now we have another question from uh, Dr. Dwyer. 
Uh, thank you for a very concise and excellent overview. The case presented showed great testicular volume and spermatogenesis response to pretreatment with FSH followed by CG. I wonder if you could share other outcomes to the treatment in relation to emotional well being and psychosexual development. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew, for the very nice question. Uh, this is uh, an important point uh, of, the, of the evaluation, sure. Uh, I do not have a, a precise evaluation in this case, uh, but surely what I can, uh, I can tell you from the experience that we have with the patient is that he was uh, uh, completely satisfied by the treatment and uh, um, he appreciated a lot the fact that uh, the testicle was uh, increasing and that he finally achieved uh, a, a normal adult volume of the testicle. And uh, so this surely is something that uh, is very important. And uh, I, can, uh, I can tell you that uh, when we compare, for example, in some cases, when we do this treatment, especially in patients where the uh, testicle maybe had uh, a um, major uh, dam during the um, the uterine life uh, they were not they are not responding well to the uh, stimulation with the, with the gonadotropin and in that case uh, patients are absolutely not uh, so satisfied like in the case in which the vesicular volume is growing either if the virilization uh, uh, level is the same between the two so surely the increase of the testicular volume is something very important uh, in terms also of uh, uh, satisfaction and psychosocial well-being, let's say. Okay, so uh, uh, in general, uh, one should try to tailor the, the, the therapy, the treatment to the patients and the family. Um, because in this case we have uh, uh, pediatric patients and we have to consider also uh, the family context. Uh, how do you manage this situation? Obviously, ob it is obvious that we would like to have a, a more physiological as possible treatment for this kind of so stimulate the gonads and uh, and so on maybe also ideally with generate pumps but uh, in uh, taking into account all the variables costs and uh, uh, the fact of uh, uh, the discomfort for patients with several injections and uh, during the week. Uh, how do you manage this kind of uh, situation initially? Because this has to be discussed with the, with the family before yeah, start. I think the, the, the most important point is what you are telling just now. So what is very, very important, and this is also reported in the guidelines, is to discuss uh, the treatment option with the patients and the family and uh, to expose them, uh, to expose them uh, all the um, possible uh, options and uh, which are the advantages and the disadvantages for one and for the other, and then to arrive together to a final decision. And uh, when uh, when we act in this way, I can tell you that uh, we finally have uh, a very nice uh, compliance of the patient. So. They usually uh, keep uh, remain uh, stick to the treatment uh, either for two and three years, uh, even if they have to be injected twice per week. Uh, and so, I think maybe the, the really the the most important point is to discuss very well the the option at the beginning with them. Yeah, because there is also a question from Doctor uh, Professor Magid Ragab uh, or Ragab, sorry. If I pronounce it wrongly, um, that is saying, isn't it too much for a kid, too much injections when you use uh, CG and FSH? You, I think you already answered. Yeah, of course, uh, a lot of injection, but uh, of course, uh, there, maybe what uh, one possible. Uh, way to reduce at least uh, a bit uh, this injection is, uh, uh, the, is what was also shown by the last study in 2022 
the use of the recombinant FSH long-acting formulation that uh, allow to make uh, injection of FSH every two weeks. So at least uh, the patients will be injected with FSH only two weeks uh, and then uh, ACG twice per week. This will be or something already better than to have three injections of FSH and two injections of ACD every week. And I also have to tell you that at least in Italy, this recombinant uh, uh, long active form is the only one that uh, is uh, not off label. It's not off label for the induction of puberty. Marco, I lost you. Is not off label. Luca, uh, you you lost the connection. Sorry? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes. Can you repeat? Sorry. You you mentioned that is not okay. off label for the. Uh, you. you uh... Hello. Marco? Yes, I'm there. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, now yes. I don't know because our uh, connection seems perfect. Is mine that is not very, working very well? Uh, I no. don't know. Maybe uh, I'm not sure because my connection seems perfect. At least the, the signal of the connection seems perfect. I don't know. I lost. We hear you both. We hear you both, and you're both back. If you want to pick back up the question, Luca. Is there another question? No, you were asking about the off-label use. Yeah, just yeah, to clarify that point. Is uh, is uh, 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 the long-acting recombinant human FSH is not off-label for the induction of puberty? Correct. Yeah. Yes, it's correct. It's the only one that is not off-label. At least in Italy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So now we can go with the next presentation that is the pubertal induction in females. And uh, this uh, presentation will be given by Dr. Biagio Cangiano, that is assistant professor of the University of Milan, together with uh, Silvia, Silvia Federici, that uh, is uh, uh, a fellow at the University of Milan. So, Biagio, you have uh, your presentation that is organized, I think, similarly to the one of Marco. Exactly. Right? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's very nice to be here. And uh, my name uh, is uh, Biagio Cangiano. With me, there's Silvia Federici. And we will talk about the pubertal induction in female subjects uh, from the perspective of the female subject. Marco and Giovanni actually already uh, shown, clear, uh, really clearly show, have shown the pubertal induction from the male's point of view, but there are some peculiarities uh, of the female subject that we want to address. Uh, first of all, we all know that the, the onset of puberty is actually different in the two sexes, and in female, uh, the onset of puberty uh, in, uh, between the age of 8 and 13 years old is considered uh, adequate and uh, any onset of the uh, breast uh, um, maturation after 13 years old can be considered a delayed puberty. Another condition that must be attentioned also in the female subject if uh, we have uh, a stop in the progression through uh, the stages, through the trunnel stages in the female subject who already began the puberty with a sudden drop of hormonal levels since this stop of the pubertal uh, development could uh, suggest, uh, should suggest uh, an underlying hypogonadism. And here I report to you uh, the guidelines on pubertal induction which indeed um, suggest to uh, perform a specialistic evaluation of every patient, every girl uh, having the onset of puberty after uh, the year of uh, after 13 years old, and in those who have uh, um, 
a predisp unknown predisposition to hypogonadism to study them from the uh, from eight years old actually. Uh, this slide on who needs to be treated is the same of the male patients, uh, just to say that also in females, uh, those to, uh, to treat, those that we have to treat are those with permanent hypogonadism. In functional hypogonadism, we just uh, need to attempt to remove the underlying cause. Uh, and also in female subjects, the constitutional delay of growth and puberty is an issue that can be addressed using low doses of sex hormones that uh, help uh, the patient with uh, the patients with their uh, psychological issues, but also the clinicians in uh, the differential diagnosis. Uh, it has to be said that uh, in female subjects, the delayed puberty, the, the constitutional delay of growth in puberty, is less prevalent than. Uh, in the male counterpart. And thus, if we have a delayed puberty in a female subject, this is more likely to, uh, to be uh, due to uh, a uh, pathological condition of uh, hypogonadism. As for the goals of pubertal inductions, obviously the goals are uh, mainly the uh, development of female genitalia and sex characteristics, uh, with the, uh, a key importance also of the uterine maturation, of which we will talk about uh, later. Uh, of course, it is important uh, an adequate um, uh, bone um, mineralization and skeletal development, which includes normal, uh, normal growth spurt and uh, uh, epiphyseal closure, which, is, which are important uh, features in order to define the future uh, body proportion, permanent body proportions of the patients, as uh, it is also shown in uh, the male counterpart, uh, and uh, the maturation of uh, neurocognitive and uh, psychosexual maturation of the subjects, of course. Uh, it is important uh, to uh, say that uh, to achieve these goals uh, in the female sex, we, ha we have just sex hormones, since it has not, uh, it has not been proven any uh, real advantage in the use of GnRH or gonadotropins uh, in the females. Uh, and uh, um, the timing and uh, the, uh, the, the timing of the pubertal induction is uh, uh, actually um, very important on the outcomes. If we are too slow in our pubertal induction, we will have a unicoid proportion as well as psychological distress in our patients, whereas if we are very quick in the induction of our patients, we risk uh, a premature epiphyseal closure losing uh, on the final height of our patients as well as on their uterine maturation. So, uh, for these reasons, it is very important uh, to uh, induce the puberty of the patients as soon as we have the diagnosis. Uh, in fact, if uh, in patients in which the diagnosis has already been made uh, because they have a, a gonadal dysgenesis or uh, they have a, a genetic diagnosis, uh, the, it is uh, suggested to uh, begin the treatment by the age of 11, also because a treatment after this threshold does not seem to give any real advantage on final height. Uh, in the reality, uh, the, uh, a great share of our patients uh, actually are diagnosed uh, after a uh, delayed puberty has uh, occurred, uh, so uh, we are uh, by definition delayed in our treatment. Uh, and so uh, we should consider the puberty induction as, uh, uh, as promptly as possible whenever we have the diagnosis actually. Uh, and now I will uh, let um, uh, Silvia uh, explain two patients from our uh, center that uh, will help us to uh, demonstrate what we are talking about. Please, Silvia. Good afternoon. I will start uh, with uh, this first patient, Rosa. Uh, she came uh, for the first time to our attention uh, at the age of 14 years. Uh, for primary amenorrhea, but however, uh, her older sister uh, had uh, recently been diagnosed as uh, a congenital hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, prom prompting uh, the clinical evaluation in Rosa. At the clinical examination, uh, she uh, had uh, an upset pubertal development, and uh, as we can see, a normal BMI and uh, a um, 
HANAID that uh, was uh, slightly reduced uh, um, uh, compared to her uh, mid-parental uh, high target uh, and no other red flags uh, at the examination. Uh, she um, then performed uh, some hormonal tests that was uh, indicative of uh, isolated hypogonotropic hypogonadism uh, and she also performed some complementary instrumental uh, tests that uh, showed a, a, delay, a very delayed bone age compared to the chronologic age and uh, an hypoplastic uterus at the pelvic ultrasound uh, and also uh, she performed performed a smell test that was uh, uh, indicative of hyposmia and lastly uh, a genetic analysis with uh, targeted uh, NGS technique that found uh, a rare variant in FGF R1 that we know is a gene associated with hypogonotropic hypogonadism and Kalman syndrome. So all these data were um, clearly indicative of uh, Kalman syndrome. Uh, then we can move on to our second patient. Uh, this patient was referred uh, to our center at the age of 20 years. Uh, however, um, she uh, had uh, already been evaluated uh, a few years earlier uh, for primary amenorrhea and uh, uh, absent pubertal development. And in this occasion, um, uh, it was uh, already being suggested to start uh, the treatment with uh, estroprogestin, but uh, the patients uh, refused, uh, refused uh, to take it. Uh, this uh, is unfortunately not uh, very common among the patients and their families uh, because uh, in spite of uh, what uh, we uh, have just discussed, um, often they prefer to have a wait-and-see um, approach. Um, however, um, uh, the clinical examination of the patients uh, was indicative of um, uh, substantially absent pubertal development, and uh, he uh, had a tall, uh, tall high, uh, even compared with the mid parental height, in association with the slightly uh, elevated arm span. Uh, this is uh, very typical uh, for the patients with the absent pubertal development in uh, avanced age. And uh, no, uh, also in this case, uh, another, uh, no other flex. So also in this case, uh, the hormonal tests uh, were uh, indicative of isolated apogonotropic apogonadism. The, bon the bone age was uh, consistent with uh, uh, epiphyseal closure uh, and uh, the pelvic ultrasound showed a uh, hypoplastic uterus. Uh, in this case, the smell test uh, was uh, normal and uh, the genetic analysis uh, found two rare variants in compound heterozygosis uh, in GNRHR. Uh, gene. So in this case, in this case, uh, the diagnosis was uh, an uh, isolated congenital hypogonotropic hypogonadism. So in summary, uh, these two patients uh, have uh, some uh, similarities, uh, mainly uh, due to the underlying diagnosis, uh, but also uh, certain different uh, differences, uh, especially uh, due to the different age uh, at, at presentation that uh, impact uh, on uh, other anthropometric uh, characteristics. However, both of these two patients need, uh, needed uh, a treatment to induce the pubertal development. But how to induce the, the pubertal development in female patients? Actually, an, act, an adequate pubertal development in girls is achieved with uh, just estrogens. And uh, the role of, progest uh, of progesterone is actually uh, just to counterbalance the endometrial hyperplasia once we have achieved uh, adult doses of estrogens. Uh, estrogen, there are different estrogen formulations uh, available, but all of them are re in, in reality uh, borrowed by, um, from the treatment of menopause, actually, because there are no um, formulations which are specifically meant 
to, uh, for the induction of uh, puberty. And uh, there are vari uh, various types of estrogens, and uh, the one which is thought to be more physiological is actually the uh, natural estradiol, which can be administered both orally or transdermally. Uh, the transdermal uh, formulation of uh, natural estradiol is, uh, uh, has the advantage uh, to bypass the so-called first-pass liver effect, thus uh, impacting less on uh, the uh, metabolism. Uh, in fact, uh, we have uh, a few studies on small cohorts of uh, subjects using different formulation of estrogens, and most of them actually are Turner syndromes, but uh, uh, with uh, the uh, evidence available, it, is, uh, it seems that the transdermal forms uh, uh, is actually more effective in the feminization uh, at a selected dose compared to the oral formulation. And uh, it has also, as you can see, uh, in the meta-analysis reported, in, reported uh, in the end of the slide, uh, that it has also a more favorable impact on markers of cardiovascular health and bone mineral density compared to oral formulations. And uh, as just uh, said, it has also uh, a um, less effect on hepatic metabolites. Uh, moreover, the transdermal formulation has, has the advantage to be uh, possible to fractionate, so we can use low doses just fractionating the uh, our uh, therapy, and thus, uh, for all these reasons, we consider advisable to choose a transdermal estrogens as a, a um, therapy for pubertal induction. But which scheme has the, the sh we should use? Uh, these are the studies which reported many different schemes to induce puberty in girls. Uh, we do not have evidence uh, letting us uh, decide which scheme is superior to another. And uh, even more important, we do not know if there is some schemes if there are some schemes which are better for some patients uh, according to their diagnosis or their uh, age at uh, presentation. Uh, anyway, we can say with the little evidence available that uh, it is advisable to start with the low doses of transdermal estrogens as low as uh, five to six microgram every day. Uh, at the beginning, they can be just uh, overnight and increase them during a period of 24 to 36 months uh, until uh, adult doses are reached of 50 and 100 micrograms every day. Uh, and the two add pro, uh, progesterone uh, only after almost two years, or at least when we have adult doses of estrogens and uh, um, adult doses of estrogens and um, excuse me, um, uh, features uh, of uh, adult features. Um, and uh, we can follow our uh, schemes, our uh, induction, uh, evaluating uh, uh, the growth of our patients and uh, uh, as well as uh, the progression through tunnel stages. We can also evaluate serum estradiol and uh, 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 pelvic ultrasounds to evaluate uh, the uterus uh, should be made at the beginning and before the introduction of progesterone, uh, also to evaluate uh, the adequate feminizations of the uh, characteristics. Um, another thing that we should uh, say is that uh, this scheme should not be taken as uh, always the same, but we should adapt the scheme to the patients since it is different if, it, uh, if we use it in a girl uh, in which the diagnosis has been made um, uh, during the normal onset of puberty or in a, a subject with delayed puberty, since we can shorten the time of the uh, therapeutic uh, induction or uh, start uh, with higher doses in these cases. Please, Silvia, show us about this. So let's return to our cases. Uh, this uh, is uh, the therapeutic regime in, in the, our first uh, patient, Rosa. Uh, here we can see that uh, um, according uh, uh, 
uh, with what we just uh, uh, seen. Um, in this case, we start the uh, started the, the pubertal induction with a low, very low dose of transdermal estrogen equal to one six uh, of uh, 25 microgram day patch. Uh, applied uh, only overnight for the first month and then uh, uh, progressively increase uh, uh, in um, a time frame of about uh, um, uh, six months uh, till the last uh, evaluation. Uh, we have to remember that uh, uh, this uh, low dose of estrogen uh, in uh, the, the first part of the pubertal induction uh, have uh, the rationale to optimize the linear growth. So we can move on to the second case. We can see that in this patient's viola, uh, we uh, have uh, um, uh, started the treatment uh, um, with the, uh, a transdermal estradiol, but uh, we can see that the initial dose was uh, slightly higher and the increases in the dose was slightly faster than the, the previous one. Uh, this is because, uh, um, as uh, uh, we have just uh, discussed, um, in uh, aiming to tailor the, the treatment uh, for uh, each patient, uh, in a patient with advanced age at the diagnosis and at the start of the treatment, uh, a very extensive regimen can be uh, uh, not uh, ideal. And so, um, we, uh, can, we can um, shorten the, the duration of uh, the, uh, the, the induction. Uh, however, we can see that uh, the patient uh, uh, had reached an adequate adult dose of uh, uh, 15 uh, micrograms a day in about 20, uh, 20 months. So um, anyway, ensuring the, the graduality of the therapy. In this chart, we can clearly see that the different age at presentation um, have uh, uh, an impact on the potential uh, of growth of the patients and so also on the goal of our uh, treatment, justifying the different therapeutic approach. In fact, we can see on the left uh, in the first patient, Rosa, uh, that uh, um, she had uh, a, a, a potential uh, a grow potential uh, also because uh, she um, presented a very delayed uh, bone age uh, and so she had a benefit from the low dose treatment with estrogen in her, uh, in her linear growth. Uh, otherwise, uh, Viola uh, at the start of the treatment uh, had uh, already reached uh, her uh, final height and even a tall height. So uh, in this case, uh, the um, uh, excessive, uh, excessive uh, attention uh, with the low doses is not uh, required for the linear growth of the patients. So talking about the clinical outcomes of pubertal progression, it is it is uh, it has been shown that actually the despite the dif the different scheme that we could use, uh, there is a, a progression through tunnel breast stages similar to that of a spontaneous puberty with a stage two B2 acquired during the first few months from the beginning of the treatment and a stage before uh, after approximately two years, uh, even if this uh, progression is uh, anyway associated with estrogen levels. And uh, talking about uh, the height of, of the patients, this, uh, besides uh, a growth which is uh, correlated, of course, with the, the diagnosis underlying the hypogonadism, uh, we all know that Turner syndromes have other um, reasons for their reduced uh, growth, uh, but uh, still it has been shown that there is an inverse uh, correlation between the growth potential and uh, the age at which the treatment has been started. 
Moreover, it has been shown that uh, the use of transdermal formulation have a lower, uh, has a lower effect on bone age progression and higher growth rate uh, as compared with the oral formulation, which could be uh, due uh, to uh, the uh, effect of estrogen on the liver, which is higher in oral formulation. And we all know that estrogens actually can produce a, a partial resistance to GH in the liver, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, talking about uh, outcomes, uh, the uterine maturation is uh, the, uh, the outcome which uh, uh, often disappoints the clinician because it has been shown that uh, a great share of our patients which, which are induced, in which we induce puberty, actually do not achieve a satisfactory uh, growth uh, length uh, compared to the general population. Even a few studies are available on the subject and uh, to our labs, to our help comes uh, actually a recent study which has been authored also by my colleague Silvia, uh, which is here, which showed that uh, actually uh, um, transdermal estradiol, uh, the, the dose of transdermal estradiol prior to progesterone uh, treatment is significantly associated with a better uterine uh, growth. Uh, and after the introduction of progesterone, actually, we don't have any more, any further progression of the uterine maturation. Uh, this uh, underlying uh, the importance to um, uh, tailor the therapy uh, also according to uh, the outcomes and the measurements that we can make during the pubertal induction. And this is the importance to evaluate the uterine dimensions before uh, introducing progesterone therapy. So let's take a step back. Uh, we saw that uh, the, our patient, Viola, uh, after uh, 20 months of estrogenic therapy, reached the uh, adequate adult dose of uh, 15 micrograms a day. Uh, and so uh, it uh, could be a, a right moment to introduce uh, the, the project into the therapy. However, as uh, we have just discussed, uh, this choice uh, is uh, very important to carefully evaluate it uh, to, uh, in order to optimize the, the uterine maturation. For this reason, we performed uh, at this point uh, the uh, ultrasound that uh, shown, showed uh, a very satisfactory uterine growth and uh, an endometrium that was still very thick. And for this reason, uh, we decide to um, increase uh, the, um, the dose uh, of estrogen to uh, 65 micrograms, uh, 70, 75 micrograms a day, uh, and uh, postponing uh, the uh, introduction of the progestin. In fact, uh, at the subsequent ultrasound evaluation, we found a further growth of the uterus and an initial thickness of the endometrium. Uh, and endometrium. So at this point, we choose to uh, start uh, the microinsert progesterone uh, for uh, 14 days uh, per month. Um, and uh, we can see uh, in this picture uh, the dynamic of the uterine maturation at the optimal timing of progesterone. So I have the honor to draw the conclusions of this second part of the talk, and they actually mirror very well what has already been said for the maze. Let me just add that uh, it is important to uh, the choice of uh, the formulation to induce the female subjects, and even if we have few uh, evidence available, it seems uh, evident that uh, transdermal estrogens uh, are uh, a better choice for uh, this task and the progressive increase uh, and the uh, timely addiction of micronized progesterone are uh, important to the achievement of uh, sex sexual characteristics in our uh, patients. And uh, I thank you for your attention and we will be happy to answer to every question you have. Well, th okay, thank you, Biagio and Silvia, uh, for this uh, presentation. I have, uh, I saw a couple of questions that are during your talk, actually three. The first one, 
what are the targets of serum estradiol uh, levels at the different stages of induction? You monitor estradiol levels and you decide uh, on what basis the increases in doses of estradiol. And the other thing, is there a role in FSH, CG in pubertal induction in females? Let's, let's start from the last uh, of the questions. Actually, there, as, I, as I was saying, there is no, not a role of uh, gonadotropins in the induction of female subjects because we don't know of any real advantage of gonadotropins, which in males are very useful for the uh, um, testicular development, uh, testicular enlargement, but in females we do not have uh, a role in the pubertal induction. They will be useful whenever we will uh, have to look for pregnancy and fertility in females, but not actually in the induction. And talking about the uh, estradiol levels uh, in uh, um, during the monitoring of the patients that are being inducted, we should first of all talk about the fact that uh, uh, our assay for the measurement of estradiol have many limitations, especially at low uh, values as the ones that we are uh, uh, measuring when we are inducing our patients. Still, we can have a hint of what we are doing, uh, looking at their value with the stradiol being lower than 40 picomolar in the, at least in the first part, in the first year, year and a half of the induction, uh, in order to avoid a uh, too uh, quick um, induction that could lead to premature epiphyseal closure in the patients as the one the one that was showing Sylvia, who have still a growth uh, potential uh, to um, exploit. Okay. Okay. You have to. You want to say something, Sylvia? Uh, no, no. I think that the the, the answer was the, the answer was complete. Uh, we can use the estradiol value um, in uh, complementary uh, with the, the, the evaluation to avoid the sobra physiologic dosage or uh, a lack of compli compliance of the patients. Yes, of course. Yeah, the compliance I think is very important eh, to check because uh, the maybe the young girls have problems with the uh, with the patches okay. and uh, especially in summer so it's very it's very problematic in some okay. you know, in but some we have case. to say that in the the first month of induction at the low dose uh, always we found with our uh, with I our say, say uh, non detectable values of estradiol okay. In the first part with very low dosage. Now, this question was given, was, uh, was received from Ravi Shah, Dr. Ravi Shah. And now we have uh, another question from Raya Almazwai, who is asking about uh, the approach when the patient is concerned about breast size and they want to increase their breast size after the completing of the induction. Do you have answers for this? after the, complete, the completion of the induction. Actually, this is uh, not something that uh, um, should be uh, a major issue when we decide uh, how to treat, even because the, um, if we have performed a, 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 an adequate pubertal induction, the breast size, the final breast size is actually uh, mostly determined by the uh, individual predisposition in the, if we, did it all right. It is just important to uh, add the progesterone once the tunnel stages have been com almost completed. We, ha we have adult features. And they're progressively increasing the dose. Yes. Because uh, the one reason of the very bad outcome on the, on the gland uh, can be uh, to start with the estroprogestin com with the combinated progesterone. therapy. At the beginning. Yeah, I had the experience of two young girls, two girls, not young at the end, but that 
uh, with the Turner or variant dysgenesis that asked for um, for breast prosthesis because they wanted uh, uh, a different size of their breast. And this, I think, is the only solution if they desire uh, another size. Then we have another question from uh, Dr. Dwyer. Uh, both the male and female cases presented, presented today highlight the importance of clinical red flag for early detection. Thank you for highlighting this key point and for the two excellent presentations. This was a comment. Do you want Thank to you very much. Comment? No. <laughs> And then again from uh, Dr. Raya al -Mazray. in adolescent who entered puberty but no menses yet and then puberty arrested after uh, brain cancer diagnosis, what is estradiol dose to start with? So a girl that has entered the, the, the pubertal development but was stopped because in this case of a neoplastic uh, neoplastic uh, problem I, I think it is it is actually very important to understand uh, that in uh, the patients who already perform had the great majority of their uh, their puberty uh, obtained and endogenously we should have shorter treatment and start to, to with high doses if these patients already achieved an almost uh, I, I, I heard it well i'm almost adult phenotype we should start with almost adult dosi, dosage I, I don't I, I don't know if i got it well it was she was already yeah, what, how do you decide do you, do, you, do you measure i don't know do you, do you with breast tanner stage, we should stage again the patient with the tanner stage, and on the basis of this, we can start from this point on. If this uh, patient already had a, a breast tanner stage of B4 or or even B5 in some uh, cases, and of course, uterine development is not. Uh... You could evaluate uterine development as in all their patients before adding the progesterone which is needed for the uh, uh, for the menses actually and uh, i'm sorry maybe i heard the wrong uh, uh she didn't say breast cancer right no I, oh. brain cancer brain. okay okay i, I hear wrong I'm sorry the puberty arrested after brain cancer okay, by okay. i hear the wrong no breast cancer is another, <laughs> is another um, issue in, another issue yeah um okay okay um so in females do you think uh, because uh, uh, the wait and see uh, let's say um, um, uh, strategy would be how would you would you consider a wait and see strategy in the up to what age would you would you go for a wait and see strategy in the absence of red flags obviously considering that in females the cdgp the constitutional delay of puberty is uh, uh, less frequent yes more rare of course uh, to mirror the part on the male uh, on the male counterpart we have a, a delayed puberty from 13 years old so from this time on we should start thinking that this patient could have an hypogonadism and, and uh, to distinguish the, the constitutional delay which is of course uh, less prevalent than in males but is still uh, a major uh, as a major part in the great share of the delayed puberty also in females we could use uh, also low doses of sex steroids to uh, help us in uh, also in uh, uh, the diagnosis of hypogonadism since if we perform low doses of sex steroids uh, and the patient has a constitutional delay we could uh, see an endogenous uh, start of the puberty and will give us will buy us time also reducing the patient's uh, distress uh, because of the condition of delayed puberty. 
So uh, as soon no, as we are in a no goals is to let's say to of steroids, sex steroids uh, in males and in females. So uh, as a global uh, question for all of you, how would you, uh, uh, in light of all of all the of all the uh, array of uh, formulations that we have either for testosterone or for estradiol, how would you imagine to do it at the best? What is your preference for the low dose? And for think, how long? Three months? Uh, I think that uh, in the males is uh, more difficult than in females because in females we use sex steroids already to induce puberty. So uh, we can actually, uh, it is uh, almost uh, the same uh, same strategy which just stops in... Uh, so transdermal uh, patch? Again, yes. okay. in males, I think that in males we can use maybe injection. Let's say testosterone ester could be uh, 50 milligram per month, uh, or otherwise uh, something that could also work very well is the tes transdermal testosterone, like uh, 10 milligrams every other day, and we can uh, try the treatment for four months, let's say, and they maybe to see if uh, we have an advancement uh, in terms of testicular volume that will indicate the presence of an internal activation of the axis. And so in this case, we can decide maybe to stop and to monitor and to see if the pubertal development will uh, continue spontaneously or not. So in males, you have the readout of the testicular volume. In females? Yeah. In females, we have to stop and to look if there, there's a progression through tunnel stages uh, without the therapy. We have Do you to have stop. biochemical uh, um, markers that can be of one, one possibility could be to, to check, for example, also for the estradiol level and yeah. to see if the estradiol level are increasing. Also, gonotropics, because if they start to uh, um, raise over 0 0.2, 0 0.5 LH, for example, this is the sign that we have uh, um, probably, as, uh, the, the, we are uh, start, this is starting to begin, let's say, like this, that the puberty is about to begin, it's about to begin, it's about to begin. Okay, I think uh, we are at the end, we come to the end, uh, we have received the uh, uh, congratulations from uh, Andrew and Raya Madrai for the talks and I hope uh, that all the other participants um, uh, were happy with this couple of presentations. Uh, thank you Marco, thank you Giovanni, thank you Biagio and thank you Silvia for your presentation. Uh, thank you Emma for the assistance and uh, all of you please uh, stay in touch and check always the endoERN website endoERN.eu uh, to check for uh, the new webinars that are coming out not only from MPG7 but uh, every week there are uh, uh, news on new webinars that are coming out in the in the future so bye bye and thank you for the participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye.